but are they yeah. on Tuesday or Thursday or? <laughs> um, they'll probably be online, so it won't matter. Yeah, probably the quizzes will be online. I, I don't know why. This this class, the last time I offered it, must have been on a uh, Monday and Wednesday or something. All right, other questions? Still with me, Ridgeville? Give a wave or a thumbs up or? All right. Yes. Okay, if, if something goes wrong and, and you're, you're having trouble hearing or seeing or, or you've lost me and, and I seem to be a runaway train and I'm not shutting up, you know, just frantically wave your arms or something uh, to get at least either my attention or the attention of the other folks uh, in class. It'd be nice if I could, it was on the projector in the back so I wouldn't have to like look like that. It'd be nice if I could like just watch that as, but oh well. You folks can alert me if they're... And if they like go out, or if they like order pizza, or they like have a party where they bring people in, let me know, all right? So if, they're, if, we're gonna, if there's going to be a party, it's going to be here. So we can go, right? So we can go, right. So we can, exactly. All right. If there are no further questions, what we will do is begin with the actual material of the class. First of all, and I'm doing this uh, partly to, to show uh, and to talk a little bit about the mobile program here at, at LC because it's, in my mind, it's one of the best kept secrets here on campus. Uh, I'm surprised that we don't have a lot more, I'm surprised there isn't standing room only in here for the mobile classes and like the mobile web development class and those things. But uh, I want to talk a little bit about the mobile world, and in doing so, we can sort of talk about the classes we offer here at LC for those. The two big things in the mobile world are, there are apps, and there are mobile web pages. So if your organization wants to have sort of a mobile presence if it wants to have the ability for its customers or its clients or however you want to put it to, to interact with it, there's a couple ways that it can go. And to sort of fast forward to the end of this story, most organizations or many, organi or many organizations pick all of the above. All right. A mobile website has what is an advantage? Easier to update. Okay, mobile web pages are typically easier to update. Why is that? You just change the code on your server and then when something right. your website is, they get what you have on there. Right. The code lives on a server. The code doesn't live on each of the mobile devices. So if I change my, if I'm doing a mobile website and I make a change to, um, to something about the, the uh, application, um, the next time someone accesses the website, they'll get those changes. As opposed to a mobile app, people would have to download and install the update for the app for that to happen. And then you're liable to have people running different versions of the app and can be, can be tricky. What's uh, some of the other advantages or disadvantages of one or the other approach? How about with apps, you can you can tap into like uh, the hardware that, okay. you're, that, you're, that you're using. Apps can be apps. Let's put it this way: can typically take better advantage of all the features of the mobile device. Not to say that that's impossible to do with a mobile web page, but you can probably do more and do it better and more efficiently and so on. So, to integrate with the camera is easy. All right? 
to integrate with your contacts list is a lot easier. And so on down the line. All right. So an app, something that's designed for the app, uh, is designed in such a way that it can more easily integrate with both the hardware and other software that lives on the mobile device. Now, that's actually in itself a good news and bad news scenario. That's the good news. What's the flip side of this and therefore sort of the bad news? Pardon me? With an application, you have to, to push updates is much harder. Um, you have to download the app to your, uh, to your device. Okay, that, that's true. That's sort of the flip side of this. What is the cost of being able to take better advantage of all the features of a mobile device? Memory and storage. Okay, yeah, memory and storage, that's true. But the cost from the developer's <coughs> perspective. Oh, you have to have know the native language. All right, you have to know the native language and to be, um, you know, to, to, to sort of be more direct, you have to have multiple versions of the app. You have to have an Android version and an Apple version minimally, and you might want to have a Windows Phone version or a BlackBerry version or whatever. So this, these apps are device specific, which means that you will need minimally an Android and an iOS version of the app, and possibly others. Mobile web pages uses standards. So therefore, uh, the, it's multi-platform by design. Now again, something written specifically for a platform is bound to do a better job taking all the advantages of that platform. Something that's written using standards where it's sort of a one-size-fits-all is bound to be less feature-rich. In a nutshell, these are the advantages and disadvantages. If I would specify another advantage of an app, I would say, just to sort of wrap things up, number one, apps can be written a little easier to not, uh, to, to be able to be run when you're not connected to the web. So you can ha run in sort of an untethered fashion. The other thing is apps are nice, concise, and to the point typically. You know, think about if I wanted to look up the weather information on my phone. I could go open up Chrome, the browser on my Android phone, and go to weather.com, maybe I have a bookmarked, or I could type in the URL, and I could go to it, and then I could I'd hit their website, I could do a little surfing around, and bang, I'd have the weather forecast. Compare that to the experience that the user would have if they had the weather.com app. You just go, click the icon, boom, your weather information is probably like just right there in your face. So apps tend to be very focused and, and very simplistic to use, whereas websites have sort of the full power of the web, but that power sort of gives a little bit of complexity in terms of, uh, in terms of uh, use for the user. All right, now, with mobile web pages, there are a variety of strategies that you can use to make your website work on a mobile device as well as a desktop device. CISS 268 is what talks about that, so we'll not really talk about that here. All right. I would be willing to let you in CISS 268 late if you want. So if you're interested at all in that and you have time Monday and Wednesday during this time slot, then I encourage you to come to that class as well. So you, you have permission to register late, I think. I think I think I can grant you permission to do that. All right. In the I O I'm sorry, in the apps world, the two big players are Android and iOS. Android um, we have two classes. We have this class, an intro class, and then we have the advanced class, iOS. We have one iOS. Um, typical, almost like, almost echoing the battles between PCs and Macs back in the old days, Apple is a very closed environment. It is, you know, there is more difficult to get an app published. Um, 
it, there, there is more stringent as far as even testing your app on a device and so on. Android works across multiple devices. There's multiple, there, there's more versions of Android available. And, uh, but that brings its own sort of complexity to things. You know, that's why, you know, Mac uh, always talks about, you know, Mac's always talked about the, the ease of use and the simplicity and this and that and the others. That comes at a cost. The cost is you got to buy their hardware and you have to play by their rules. With Windows machines, you could go get a Windows machine at a fraction of a cost of a Mac. But the problem is, is the software written has to work on a variety of platforms with subtle differences in them. Usually it works out okay every now and then. Like if you go to the App Store in Android, you'll see things like, you know, this doesn't work on a Galaxy, this doesn't work on this, for whatever quirk uh, of that. One statement before we continue about this is um, you don't need an Android phone or an Android tablet to, to work in this class. I have ones that I'll supply you um, if you want. Uh, and, um, or you can actually work using an emulator if you want. Um, the emulator typically has some performance issues with it though. So, uh, folks at Ridgeville, if you need an Android device, I can get one to you that you can share over there. All right? I will make a point to do that, um, hopefully by next class. The other thing I would suggest is I would suggest if you have a laptop, bring it and use it for this class, and, as opposed to relying on the setup uh, of the machines here. Um, if you notice, you know, I bring my laptop to class. Why? Because it's, you know, you get it going, you get it set up right, then you don't have to worry about like coming in the next day and there's an issue with the way it's installed or whatever. All right, so if you have a laptop, I would suggest you go through that. That will make it much more seamless for you when you want to go and develop something um, as opposed to moving it back and forth between the machines here and, and, and there. If you don't have a laptop, then you know uh, the machines in the lab, I believe, are configured for Android, and, and we can test that out and catch any problems with that. All right. That really is your goal for this week. Your goal for this week is to familiarize yourself enough with the Android development environment so that you can at least open and run some sample test code. Okay? The textbook has some example programs and I'm going to talk to you about first of all what you need to install to get things working in an Android environment. And secondly, how to go and open some of these example programs and run them. And then depending on the time, we'll, we'll start to look at the anatomy of an Android app. All right? So, what do you need? Mr. Questions? Yes. Yeah, I have a question. Um, looking at your component list there, um, you're suggesting for us to use Eclipse IDE? Yes. Um, Google is suggesting to stop using that and to start using Android Studio. Okay. And I wasn't sure if you were aware of that or if you had, we have plans to use that. Um, I, I have seen some about uh, Studio. I will check that out. Um, and uh, again, you, you know, I'll, I'll allow that to the individual student if they want to run that. I'll, I'll spend some time checking that out. Um, and uh, and see uh, and and see uh, about that. So that's a that's an excellent question. All right, let's talk about what you need um, to install in the Eclipse environment. Okay. And again, I'll do some research before Thursday's class to see possibly we'll backpedal and, and, and use the Google Studio environment instead if, if it offers some distinct advantage. What's the only problem is it's still in beta. It's off the cliff. Okay. I've tried it, and it has advantages for sure. Okay. 
but it's still in beta. So. Okay. Uh, one of the students here has mentioned that they have tried using that, and given it is still in beta, uh, there's some glitches with it. So, um, I, I, I suppose if you want to take that on, um, you can. Um, I would suspect that um, once we get beyond the initial startup where we talk about how to install and run, um, we'll be looking at the code. You know, it doesn't matter what IDE you're using. Um, so if you want to use a Google Studio, you're welcome to. But I'll do some investigation um, in the meantime. All right. In an Eclipse environment, let's see what you need to run Android. First of all, you need Java Software Development Kit installed. Now that's different than the Java Runtime Environment, or JRE. So you need to be able to develop and run and, and, and create and compile Java programs. Android is a Java-based environment. So the code we're going to be writing is going to be Java code. So therefore, you need Java to be installed for this to work. Second thing that you need is and again, this is assuming that we're using Eclipse. And again, the examples in the book are Eclipse. So again, if you want to use um, another ID, you're welcome to. But um, to keep consistent with the book, the Eclipse IDE. And IDE stands for what? Yes. Integrated Development Environment. Integrated Development Environment is your tools to create applications. So, Eclipse is to sort of the Java and Android world, sort of what Visual Studio would be. All right? In other words, Visual Studio, you don't have to use an IDE to create software, but when you're dealing with some very complicated frameworks, such as the Android framework and the Visual uh, or the uh, ASP.NET framework, the IDEs give you some, some clear cut advantages. All right? So you need an IDE, and, and again, uh, for this particular example, we're talking about Eclipse. All right. You need then, after that, you need to install the Android SDK. All these are sort of layers that build on each other. This is actually less intimidating than it sounds. It sounds like a lot of work and it's listed in your book and it can be tricky, but not impossible to do. The next thing you need is you need the ADT plugin for Eclipse. Essentially, what that does is that allows the Eclipse IDE to talk with the Android SDK. So there's a plugin. Eclipse has been an IDE previous to the existence of Android, so there's a plugin that allows that to talk. Then you need at least one Android platform. All right. Android platform is essentially a version of the Android operating system. And um, you can develop for certain versions. Certain versions of, of it have slightly different rules, have slightly different capabilities. So um, if you want to take advantage of a capability in the version, you would have to have that version of the Android platform enabled. Typically, what I do is in the classes, I just download one of the newer ones or the last one. You know, the last time I did this, you know, I downloaded a new one. There might be some revision since then, but um, you need at least one of these. Then, last but not least, you need either an Android device or 
a virtual device on which to run your Android apps that you develop. Uh, the device is pretty straightforward. There are some settings on the device end that we'll look at that you have to set um, in the user settings uh, that you have to set to allow Android development to be run and we'll look at those in a minute. Um, or you can create a virtual device. What I'd like to do now is I'd like to open up um, Eclipse and look at some of these things. And we, we might look going sort of from the back of the list going up, looking at the Android versions and the virtual device. All right. First of all, this is Eclipse. And if you look here under We have the Android SDK Manager. That's where we can download different versions of the Android operating system. In addition to, in a, um, this allows the basic Android SDK to be downloaded and installed and the different versions. So if we're looking at our chart, this and this is addressed through here. This shows that I do have the Android SDK installed at Rev 22.3 and that there's an update. Uh, Likewise, I have uh, SDK Platform Tools 19 and there's a Rev for 20. If you look then, these are the different specific Android platforms. So I have Android 4.4 installed on this development, which is an A API level 19. And I don't have any of the other ones. It might not be a bad strategy to um, create a, um, you know, to have installed both an old version of the API and a new one so that you can test things and make sure that they run under the lower environment as well. In my case, just for the simplicity, I only have the one. This allows you to go in and update those. So I could click if I was interested in doing it right now, I could click install packages and it would see everything I had that needed updates and it would install those. Also under this, there's the Android Virtual Device Manager. And what this allows you to do is to create virtual devices. <coughs> so for example, I created a virtual device called Test2 which matches one of my targets, the Android 4.4. All right. I could click New and create another one for a different version. In addition, I can set up certain parameters based on it. In other words, assuming how, how much internal storage it has, what memory options it has, and so on and so forth. So I could pick a new test device and I can pick what kind of device it is. That way if you were testing something that would run on a phone versus a tablet you could emulate without physically having a phone and a tablet you could create two different um, virtual devices and test it on one and test it on the other. When you go to test an app all right, it will look at everything that it possibly could run it on your virtual devices and if you happen to have a regular device plugged in. And it'll ask you which one of these you want to, uh, wh which one of them do you want to run it on. All right. Okay. Let's look at what your lab is for this week. Because your lab for this week doesn't require you to create any 
any apps, but rather to just be able to run and get screenshots of an app that's running. Install the platform on a machine that you can use at home and work. If you don't have access to the machine, let me know. We can discuss alternatives. Import the tip calculator app. That is one of the, um, that is one of the uh, apps that comes with the uh, textbook. There's a place where you can download uh, the code for these. I want to see some screenshots. I want to see the tip calculator app running on a virtual device. If you're not using a virtual device and you're using an actual device, if you can take a screenshot of it. That would be, that would be great. And then I want to see some certain files from there to just show that you know how to navigate around the files. All right? So you don't have to write any code for this assignment. You just have to make sure everything's installed correctly and that um, you can run it and you can navigate at least through the basics of, uh, of this. Now that isn't necessarily a small feat. All right? That actually can be tricky and that's why it's an assignment. Um, the way software is developed now with, with you know, uh, very component based where different, there's different software to handle different pieces of the puzzle, um, that's the downside of it, is that some of your time is spent just making sure stuff talks to each other in the right way. And so this will be a, little, a good uh, exercise for um, installing and making sure stuff works. Yes? I'm missing the, I don't see anything in the assignment folder. Are my version here. Okay. Ah. Try it now. All right. There we go. All right. What I'd like to do now is to show you, let's say you've gone and you've installed the app, uh, you know, everything. And you think you're ready, and you think it works, and you think you're ready for it to work. And you've downloaded the sample applications off the, the textbook uh, publisher's uh, website. Let's see how we can go in and we can run the application, how we can import it, first of all, and then how we can run the application. All right? I'll show you how to do that. And once you know that, that's enough. Once you do that, that will be enough for the first lab assignment. After that, we'll go a little further and start looking at the anatomy of an Android app. So, from within Eclipse, you go to File, Import, and I'm going to import existing code into my workspace. Existing Android code into my workspace. I browse to wherever that is. So wherever that is on your disk, you browse to it. Okay. In my case, Code Examples Original, that's where the stuff is. Let's go and bring up the very simple welcome application. I click on the folder that contains the application. What do I mean by the folder that contains the application? Well, underneath that folder you'll see bin, resources, generated, SRC, assets, and so on. You'll effectively do what I'm doing except for the tip calculator application. All right, in which case you'll click on that folder. I click open and then I click finish and it brings the application in, all right, to my workspace. Now, a whole bunch of stuff here and this is where after I finish running it, this is where we'll spend the discussion of the anatomy of an Android application and start getting you used to that. All right. Right now, there are two platforms, there are two 
quote, devices that this application could run on. There's the actual physical tablet that I have here. All right. <coughs> There's the actual physical tablet I have here. It's connected via USB to the computer. And there, of course, is the virtual device, which was defined. So, I'm going to right mouse on the application, on the app, and I'm going to click Run As Android Application. When I do that, it's going to ask me, what do I want to run it on? On the top is my choice of actual physical Android devices. On the bottom is the um, virtual devices that I define that this particular app could run on, depending on the version it was created under and so on. So I'm going to run it on the actual Android app. So I'm going to click that and OK. And it will take a little bit of time. Oh. The problem is I've already installed it here, and, and it, it thinks that it's a waste of time to reinstall it. So I'm just going to trick it by putting in, by changing the code and putting some blank spaces in. Now it notices that it's different, and it will install it. We'll talk more about this going forward, but there we go. Running target 4.03. Let's see what version that is. CPI 15. There we go. 
We'll talk more about this after I get my Uh, again, this already has that installed, so let me uninstall it from this. And finally, yay, Hello World app <coughs> appears. Simply shows um, the little Android logo and the little Deedle bug. And welcome to CISS 265 Android development. Problem I was running into, we'll, we'll spend more time talking about those problems um, as I, um, you know, um, I had a version an earlier version of the software installed here that I forgot about. That's why I got the one error. The other error is I uh, forgot to go in and change in, uh, the manifest certain information. We'll come back to some of those issues um, um, you know, probably next time. We'll do another example of these and go over these. But what I would like to do with the remainder of the time is start to familiarize yourself, uh, start to familiarize you with sort of what um, uh, an Android app is made up of. Let me try to run this in the emulator. I don't know. I'll, I'll, tr I'll start it up and, and I'll try and we'll see. Here it is. Gonna think about it. This will be a good background task. We can go and we can do other things while it's thinking about it. We'll see if it pops up. All right. All right, there, there the emulator has popped up, but has not yet installed the software on it. It's thinking about it and it's working on it. It looks like it's on 63 of 118. All right, we'll just let that chug in the background. All right, let's look at the anatomy of the um, Android application. First of all, we have the particular Android classes, the Android SDK. All right, that's there. That's nothing that you will mess with. You'll install it, but that's it. All right, it's there and it's the basis. The SRC is your source code, all right? And we'll go over creating this from scratch, all right? Right now, I think it's best if we just focus on, we already have an app. Um, let's look and see what pieces are. And then in subsequent classes, we'll actually create one from scratch, all right? But the SRC is your source code. This is where you're going to put your Java classes in, all right? And 
You'll give a namespace for those, or a package name, actually is the precise word, that will identify your stuff compared to anyone else in the world that might have a class named welcome.java. All right? So you give a package name to sort of uniquely qualify your code um, compared to other Java developers. So underneath source, you have a package, all right, which is typically done in reverse URL form. In other words, this is a DEEDL sample program, so the package name for it is com.deedle.welcome. Their, web their website is deedle.com, so if you just reverse that. If we were doing development here, all right, we might use edu.lorainccc.cissus265 as our package uh, name. In the package, there's going to be Java classes. Now, you've all done programming, um, and you've all at least touched on object-oriented programming, I would assume. And this is where we put our classes. Classes in Java and with .java. And we have, in this case, we have one class. We have a welcome class. Underneath that is a list of the methods. And you'll see the properties and methods associated with the class here. This being a not particularly exciting application only has the one simple method. If we click on the class, we can actually see the code. So there's not a lot of code in here, but that's the code for it. And it only has the one method which is on create. So we'll look at other examples and see uh, a little bit more uh, extensive examples of this. But again, this underneath here is, it will be the methods and attributes of it. Gen is generated Java files. All right. And, yes. Um, if you're showing stuff on your screen, we're not seeing that here. Okay. I'm sorry. Let me try that. There it is. Okay. Excellent. To, to rewind for a second, I'm showing the app. There is the Android SDK. There will be a source folder underneath that that will have your package name. In this case, it's com.deedle.welcome. And then underneath that will be the uh, any of your classes and underneath the classes there's a list and you can jump directly to, to the method for that. So that's really all we've done so far is, is talk about the app has the SDK, has your source with your classes organized by package. And your classes again end in a dot Java and they are Java classes. And we'll talk more about the details of that Java class um, in subsequent classes. The gen folder, again, is something that gets generated. So every time you recompile it, it's going to regenerate those things. And therefore, you don't want to make any changes to any of the stuff there. All right, so you pretty much stay out of there. The asset folder is where you can put other related files that your application might use. The bin is where you actually get the compiled version of the code. Right? Again, that's also generated when you compile or run it. So we're not really going to mess too much with that. RES folder is an important folder because it contains a list of Android resources. And we'll spend a fair amount of time talking about these different resources. It almost gets, how do I want to put it? It almost seems odd at first how many files you need. You know, there's the old thing, it takes a village. <coughs> It takes a village worth of files and classes to create an Android app. Because if you look, I have a drawable. This would be my images. 
And I have in there the Android PNG, the bug PNG, and the icon. I have a LDPI that has the icon, and I have the drawable, and I have the icon again. So I have three versions of the icon. All right. I have a layout, and I have a set of string values. In the resource folder, you have a resource name, a dash, then what is called a resource qualifier. All right. What the resource qualifier does is it tells the Android system which resource is relevant for a particular situation. In this particular case, HDPI means a high density uh, per inch, low density, and medium density. Different icons are provided depending on the kind of screen your application is being displayed on. All right. If you are displaying on a low density machine, you have a smaller, a low density screen, low DPI, you are, uh, your, your icon is going to be smaller. So if we look at this, the LDPI, if I double click on it, that's the icon for a low density one. For medium density, it's going to be a little bit bigger. And finally, for a high density, is bigger still. This is a confusing part of Android, but for now, just take it on faith that the higher density, the bigger the image is going to be. You got more density, you can get, you can display a better picture. So you you give a bit a bigger picture for it to be displayed. In the layout field, uh, uh, folder rather, there is a main.xml. And this is the user interface. If I double click it and open it, I will see XML code that corresponds to this. All right. There's my UI. If I look at this, and again, we, believe me, we'll come back to cover this in more detail, but this is the XML code to produce that. I have some text on the top. I have a droid image. And then lastly, I have a bug image. All right. The last resource that we'll talk about is the strings file. We don't use any hard-coded strings in our Android code or in our layout files. We always refer to the string file. So for example, in this case, the string file contains hello world welcome. It contains the app name of welcome. And it contains a welcome message, welcome to CISS 265. Android app development, which if you recall, is what you saw when we ran the app. What's the advantage of doing uh, this? Yes? What's the reasoning for having those in a separate resource like that instead of using magic strings? Well, instead of doing what? Instead of using hard-coded strings. Okay, instead of using hard-coded strings. I, I didn't hear you correctly. Well, let me ask you that. What's the reasoning for having all your strings in an XML file instead of just hard coding that in there? Boy, there's a, I don't know if you heard that original, but there's like a blast of thunder as I asked that question. Yeah. Didn't hear that here. Um, well, you could have easy reuse, so you can reuse that text in other places in the app, of course. What? There would be that. Yeah, well, one thing, one thing closely related to that is consistency, right? If you wanted to have, say, a copyright message 
and it appeared on several screens throughout the app, you could get that copyright message worded correctly and you wouldn't have to worry about being inconsistent. Um, so yeah, that's, that's one reason. You had your hand up, Susan? I was going to say you have just only one place to go when you want to change it. Yeah, one place to go when you want to change it. That's also nice. How about localization? And probably the biggest win is localization. In other words, this language is written in English. What would I need to do to create this application so that it worked for a user in France that spoke French? I would not have to change any of the code. I would simply create a French resource file. So right here, where I have values, I would have values-fr. All right. Remember, there's the name of the resource, then there's a resource qualifier. The resource qualifier determines under what circumstances, and there's all sorts of resource qualifier relating to screen density, relating to screen size, relating to language, um, or probably some of the most common ones, but there's a whole slew of them that exist. So without touching my program, if my company previously was doing ver uh, business in, say, the United States and wanted to go into Mexico, and we wanted to have a Spanish language version of our app, without touching any of the code, would simply make a second values folder, and we would put in there the Spanish words that corresponded to this. And our app would be localized um, very straightforward. All right. We'll cover resource qualifiers in more, uh, in more detail later. Again, you know, it, it seems, how do I want to say this? It seems like it's a lot of effort, it seems like a lot of work, but really by separating things in components, we can swap one component in and another component out without any, um, you know, without anything flinching. You know, even like screens, we have a layout that contains a main XML. We could create a different layout for a tablet versus a phone. So if the screen was big, we could have one layout XML. If the screen was small, we could have a dother, uh, another uh, screen uh, or uh, main XML that went and did that. Any questions? What I will do for next time is, first of all, I'll look into that Google Studio to see uh, if I can form any opinion on that um, as, far as, its, as far as its use. Um, we will then go in and start looking at some of these things more closely. We really just sort of took um, an overview of these things to see, um, you know, to, to see the main parts of an Android app. But then we'll start getting more into the details of stuff and look at some other examples. All right, questions? All right, Ridgeville, it was nice virtually meeting you. Uh, we'll see you on Thursday. Okay, see you then. Folks that are here.